the ego is selective about everything in this world. And that's another thing that comes into our discussion now is when, if you would, would you rather be right or happy, is really saying, would you rather be right about selective perception or whole perception? Because I'll tell you right now, the only happiness that you'll ever experience that's truly lasting is on whole perception. To see the world as a whole. Make this year different by making it all the same. Specialness is selectivity. Specialness is having selective loved ones. Selective things that are valuable. Selective things that are important. It's the ego that tries to find the villain. There, it searches through everything to find who's to fault, who's to blame, because there must be someone to blame. The ego doesn't know what innocence is, and if the ego tries to use the innocent concept, like innocent victims, like they were just children, they were just six years old, they were just seven years old, they're innocent at the expense of guilt. Selective. Who is the innocent ones and who is the guilty one? This is duality. And this is what we're talking about with the way the ego set the world up. Subject, object, split. The observer and the observed. The belief that there's a person, like Karen was saying, that's outside there, and then suddenly, oh, they think they're right. How dare they think they're right? But, but the very mechanism that puts them out there, that seems to put separate brothers and sisters with separate minds and separate thoughts, that's what we have to go into. We have to get to the root of that. Because there's a fundamental problem with seeing a fragmented world, private minds, private thoughts, and then selectively picking the innocent ones, even if they're young bodies, mm -hmm. and saying, oh, that's, that's terrible. And then the anger comes up, and the grief, and then the, like you were just saying, searching, searching, a mad search to find the culprit, to find the guilty one. And who would want innocence if it has the price of guilt? Mm -hmm. Do we think we could ever find innocence within ourselves while we're making somebody else guilty, or even making ourselves guilty and trying to see somebody else as innocent, and us as the victimizers. It's still the fundamental split that we have to explore. It's the only way we'll find peace. And then we just take, take the, even the seems horrific, we just take it in deeper and deeper and deeper, and, and we, we look at the, who is the I, who you know, we take a look at any, any perception that isn't supremely happy, and we have to look at it. You know, Jesus says the reason that, that illusions seem to persist and, and misperceptions persist is because there's something that's being hidden, something that's being pushed out of awareness or denied or not looked at. And this whole thing, it doesn't matter what the, what the headline is, what the scenario, it could be anything. It, if we're having an upsetting emotion, then we, we simply can conclude that there's something that we haven't looked at that we, we need to look at. Because it's, because it's by not looking that it's protected. It's, you know, I love that line in the Course where he says, the more you look at fear, the less you see of it. Don't you love that line? The more you look at fear, the less you see of it meaning the more you look within at the unconscious fear that you've pushed out of awareness, the less you will see of it, the less you will even perceive it in your world, because it's all mind. It's all mental. It's all mind. There's not a, a projected world that's out there. It's, we're just dealing with the horror that has been our fragmented mind and saying, come up, come up. So, to me, this is 
is the, s the fast track. We're on the fast track to, to doing this. And we can do it whether we look at our relationships and we say, oh, have I been selective in my relationships? Selective in my perception of relationships, in the importance that I give to some. You know, there's, now they say the population is, is over seven billion human beings on planet Earth. Have I been selective ever in my perception of those seven billion? And that's a good thing to, to look at in an honest way, because I'll guarantee there's going to be guilt associated with that selectivity. If I, if I have some that I adore, and some that I am repulsed by, and some, I'll say, a big group of them that I'm completely indifferent to. John Doe, Jane Doe, the, you know, the meaningless names and faces that seem to have no impact. If, if I'm selected in my perception of people and relationships, or animals, you know, people have been saying for years that that in the Bible they talk about the serpent. The snakes have had a bad name going on <laughs> ever since Genesis. Oh, the serpent. Everything was just really good until the serpent. Uh, but there's no problem with the serpent, but in this sense, listening to the serpent, li listening to a lie is what it was just a metaphor for. But if we have a hierarchy of, of animals, you know, People used to tell me, you know, well, I don't like rats, uh, but I like squirrels, and I like chipmunks, but I don't like rats. <laughs> and it'd be like, okay, there's some selectivity <laughs> going on there. But see, I'm saying really it's the selectivity that we have to start to honestly take a look at, because it's one, it has to be a mechanism in our mind. It can't really be that there's something like that in form that can terrify us, it's, that can take our peace away. What kind of peace of mind would that be if an event like that could just s snap it away from you so quickly? And the children seem to die last week and so forth, and then the next day they said, oh, the details are emerging. The way it happened, the, the, that word horrific was just one adjective used among many. Um, and, and then we start to look that even our, our concept of death and, and what we believe to be death of the body is on a scale of selective oh, yeah. ways of dying. You know, there's dying of natural causes. Oh, oh, people go, oh, he just died in his sleep, or she died in her sleep. Oh, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Uh, then there's other things like suicide. Oh, suicide. Selective, that's not good. That's, that's, that's a, definitely a not a good way to die. Uh, oh, they were hit by a bus. Well, that was quick. It was quick. They didn't suffer. It was very quick. Uh, you know, it's selective death. Really not seeing that the ego is the death wish, and it's this, again, selective perception of all these specifics, and hierarchies of illusions, and preferences, and all these things, that are we going to examine that way of looking and perceiving, and really face that, and how we're still trying to hold on to that, or cling on to that, or keep it hidden. And even the selective forms of death, you know, are part of the problem. And death isn't outside of us, you know, when we see things. I mean, remember when we were kids, do you ever remember when your parents took you to the first, your first funeral home, when you were a kid? I mean, some of us, maybe you didn't, you, so you missed out on that, but I remember the first funeral home, like they said, David, we're going, we're going to pay our respects. And I said, what's, what's that? I never heard that before. Pay, pay our respects. And they said, well, so-and-so died and they're going to be laid out. And I said, what do you mean? Laid out? <laughs> and it's going to be in this casket. And it's like, what's a casket? It's a box. And they're going to be 
You mean they're dead and, and we're going to go view them in the box and this is what we're doing tonight instead of going to McDonald's and, you know, and going to the baseball game and something? We're going to go look at a dead person? Yes, and there'll be lots of your relatives there too because we're all going to pay our respects. I mean, I had been to a doctor's office before and maybe at the hospital visit once before and I was not I kept asking about this, what's this place, what's all, what's this place, and what are, what are all these people doing in these rooms? But then to go to my first, it wasn't a funeral, it was actually, they call it the, where they lay them out. Like, you know, they had a whole name for it and everything. And I remember going in the room and the way that people were dressed and the, the somber kind of feel, and then they kept like saying, come with me, and they were like, and I'm like, Oh man, What's, I've got to go, what? Look and come up close and like, and white and powdery and stiff and, you know, this it was a very unnatural at the time kind of feel for me because it was, I had no idea of that and yet I can now see that it was my selective perception of my categories of living and dead and looking at the dead. I mean, I, I couldn't understand why. Why do I have to look at the, de the dead? Well, it was the Holy Spirit and underneath saying, we need to look at what you believe about living and dying. We need to look at what your feelings are around this. This is good. This all things work together for good. This was a good thing, but at the time, it was very awkward for me, very, very awkward. Whatever you need to face, whatever is kept out of awareness, you need, needs to be brought into awareness. I know, uh, you know, I had a fear of heights, and so I'm glad they took me up to the Karoo Tower, the top, the observatory deck uh, on the highest building in Cincinnati. Because when they got me up there on the Karoo Tower, and they took me over to where the lights are and everything, and I looked out as the wind was blowing, and I'm like, oh! I felt queasy, and when I went on roller coaster rides, uh, I felt queasy. And I know I had this thing too about blood. I don't know, uh, that was one way that it played out for me when I was younger, but I had this thing like when they would take, they put the little prick your fingers, and the first time I, I went in, I think it was, it was to the hospital getting ready for a tonsillectomy and they said, well, we, we're required to take your blood and they started prick, prick, prick and then they had these tiny little tubes and I was like, ah. I, it was something about red blood coming from the body. It's some kind of mental association because I they had to quick come in with the smelling salts, you know, to because I was, I was going out. Then I had to go into the hospital for a hernia operation and I went, oh, and they put the big vials. There weren't these little tubes when I, a few years, now they're, they're like, oh, oh, oh. So, <laughs> so years later, what happens is I'm identified as a vegetarian. They're, my friend and I are both, he's into Yogananda, I'm into A Course in Miracles. And he says, look, he's got a newspaper ad. They want vegetarians like us to study, and they're going to, Trick, they're going to take blood over a period of like four or five days and increasingly take blood from your body as part of a study for vegetarians like us and we get paid money and we get money. I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> and so I prayed and I got, you precisely have to do this study because you know why, you know, you faint every time you've had, the brief times you've had it, and so this is going to be, and it turned into this major forgiveness lesson, but that was one of the early times in my life that I can remember where I had the choice to run away right. and, and keep the fear right. mysteriously hidden, or to actually walk right into what I considered the fire and face that on a daily basis. And those are the things that, those, that's the road less traveled for me. It was like, I just wasn't going to cower and 
That's and right. run away. I was going to face whatever it was. And I didn't even know what it was, but I was going right. to find it. It was the last thing I did. Very helpful. When I was older, in my 20s, then somebody came to me and says, listen, I want you to train and to volunteer. And I said, well, what? And they said, hospice. I want you to train to be a hospice volunteer. And you talked about your mother's body and how it looked. Well, guess what hospice is good for? They only take in the ones that are ready to die, that seem to be falling apart, that seem to be what the world would call decrepit, decaying, on the last leg, uh, you know, turning gray, turning purple, turning blue, and you know, and I'm like, and what, what do we do as a hospice volunteer? Well, you go in and you, you attempt to bring comfort and you take trays of food in and drinks to them into their rooms and everything. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. It, again, there was something in there about dying, what I perceived dying on the screen, that I was very, very uncomfortable with. But years later, the Holy Spirit's like, no, I will show you the way. We, I, will, I will show you a miracle at that hospice ward. You will have miraculous experiences that will totally transform your experience of this hidden death wish idea that you still have not fully brought into awareness. And it was extremely valuable. It was very miraculous. I actually had, had people on the ward when I was going around and I was in the Course of Miracles and I had the miracle flowing and I would pray before I would go in there and I was literally taken into rooms where people would sometimes come out of comas or sit up or look me straight in the eye like I was coming to bring them some really important message that they've been waiting for and I would say whatever the Holy Spirit would have me say, go to the light and you don't need to hold on anymore, you're not guilty, you're completely innocent, you did a great job, you did a great job, you can let go now. I mean, I was amazed, I'd take the tray in and at this point I was heavily into the miracle working, heavily into the mind training, and I was far cry from the, the young adolescent that was terrified to look at the bodies in the caskets. And they, the best part about it was they would, they would be happy, they would be joyful, they would light, their faces would light up from whatever the Holy Spirit said, it would reflect right back to me. And then, the next day when I would come in, they had checked out. I, I wasn't healing the sick and raising the dead. I had the highest checkout rate of any volunteer in hospice. Checkout, 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 checkout. Even though they'd come in and they'd say, we never know when they're going to go. It's a mystery, David. They could go any minute, any hour. It could be days or weeks. No, he not said, for let me. me talk to them. I, let me talk to them. Boom, checkout, 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 checkout. Why? Why would they check out so fast after I'd just seen them? Next day, I talk to so-and-so, I go and look at the thing, gone. I talk to so-and-so, gone. Was because my message was, don't hold on to anything of this world. You are perfect, you are innocent, I know you who you are right now, and guess what? Those were reflections of my mind. I wasn't going in there to go, oh, heal, heal. I had a bigger message than trying to keep a, a decaying body going for a few more weeks or months or years. My message was, your kingdom, our kingdom is not of this world. Arise, O soul, and lay down the forms of this world for once and for all. Lay them down and you are perfect and healed and whole. You are happy. You did a great job. You did a spectacular job, but it's over now. It's time to let go. I, that was my message, was let go. It always came out in different forms. I love you, you're innocent, and let go. And, and that, to me, was a really miraculous time when I was on the hospice ward because I was teaching and learning the eternalness of our being and the unreality of the form. I wasn't trying to heal the body. I'd go home and read the Course, and I'd pop it open, and Jesus would say, 
Don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. Ask the Holy Spirit for a different perception of the body. How's that for a healing experience? That's taken it right from the Course, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a whole new perception of the world, not a selective perception. So these are, you know, this is why we're here, is we're here to, to learn from these examples that we can do that with, with rats, we can do that with the body, we can do it with food, we can do it with climate, we can do it with relationships, we can do it with family concepts, we can do it with anything. Because why? Because it's already been done. It's already been done for us, and all we have to do is accept what's been done, already there for us. And to me, that's what enlightenment's about. Plain and simple. Nothing else.